Good morning, everybody. Um, the title of this panel is Intelligence in the 21st Century, which is as wide as diffused. Um, we have 75 minutes. I will open with a short introductory and uh, presenting our distinguished guests and then start the discussion. They gave me an earpiece, so I'll, be, I'll, I'll get a strict warning when our time is up. Um, and so we need to keep it as short and concise, and I think that we have the right people to, to do so. Um, before in, in, uh, making the introduction, I would like to share you one memory. This is not the first time for me. I just recalled facing or participating in a panel called Intelligence in the 21st Century when I was a PhD student in Cambridge in early of last decade, there was a class called History of Intelligence and a specific, um, specific lesson called uh, Intelligence in the 21st Century and Counterterrorism. And the professor came that day to Cambridge and said, uh, Professor, which I'm not going to name, not to embarrass him, and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that I need to teach you about intelligence and about the importance of intelligence, the future of intelligence, importance of intelligence and counterterrorism. But to tell you the truth, I think it's not relevant. I think intelligence is not relevant. It never was relevant. It didn't have the real effect on history. And you know, terrorism, our days, well, maybe in the past, but this is, there are more important topics on the world agenda. Uh, just to add one, Fun fact, the, this meeting took place on the 5th of September 2001. Uh, that professor doesn't teach anymore in Cambridge. <laughs> so I think that there is, no, um, there is no debate today on the profound importance of intelligence. And I think we have the right people to discuss this. Um, the first one to my left, Secretary Michael Chertoff is a lawyer who served as a federal prosecutor and as a, the assistant U.S. Attorney General. 2005, he was appointed U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, a job in which he had to deal with much of the repercussions of 9-11, uh, co-authored the famous Patriot Act. Upon retiring, he became the executive chairman and co-founder of the Chertoff Group, uh, which, if I may add from a personal knowledge, reside in one of the most beautiful buildings in D.C., <laughs> and with the best views, so if ever Secretary Chertoff invites you, do not miss the opportunity to, uh, to visit. Secretary Chertoff is leading the Globsec Intelligence Reform Initiative, which just produced an excellent report on the future of intelligence, which hopefully we'll be able to refer uh, later. Thank you for being with us, uh, Secretary Chertoff. Dick Schuf, National Coordinator for Security and Counterterrorism at the Ministry of Security and Justice of the Netherlands, The Hague. Um, and Mr. Schuf is at the center of a unique attempt to try and create an interdisciplinary, interagency coordination entity that would better fight counterterrorism in uh, Holland. And hopefully, he will be able to tell us more later on. John Frank is the Vice President, EU Government Affairs, and is leading the Microsoft Brussels office. Prior to this role, Frank was, and I hope I pronounce this right, Vice President and Deputy General Counsel leading the Digital Trust and Security Group, which includes the Law Enforcement and National Security Team, the Digital Crime Unit, the Industry Affairs Group, all in Microsoft. Uh, Mr. Frank joined Microsoft in Paris in August 1994. There were computers back then, imagine. Mr. Frank received uh, his AB degree from Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University and the JD from Columbia Law School. Last but not least, uh, Ilka Salmi, who spent many, many years in a very interesting and huge variety of different duties at the Finnish Security Intelligence <coughs> Service, <coughs> SUPO, dealing mainly with counter-espionage, counter-terrorism, and counter-extremism. I'm going to ask you afterwards, what's the difference between counter-terrorism and counter-extremism, and isn't this just euphemism, political correctness? Uh, Mr. Salmi was a special advisor to the Ministry of Interior, and uh, in, in 2007 became director of security of the Security um, Intelligence Service. A post he left in 2011 when he took his job as the EU Intelligence and Situation Center. Nowadays, he's the director, director general, uh, general for human resources and security at the European Commission in Brussels. So as I said, there's no dispute on the importance of intelligence. But after saying that, 
does do the intelligence services of the democratic world, of the West, of Western Europe, of the United States, supply their citizens, their countrymen, the people who uh, they send them to protect them, the shield they deserve? Just mentioning few of the recent failures of intelligence services, they didn't see the establishment of ISIS, and they didn't, and still la profoundly lack intelligence of what is happening in Raqqa and Mosul. They didn't know about the coming invasion of Russia to Crimea, to Ukraine, and then to Syria. Europe sustains attack after attack of terrorism. Most of these attacks are not prevented, and if prevented, in most cases, just by mere coincidence and luck. Two bears, one called Cozy Bear, the other one Fancy Bear, APT-21 and APT-28 uh, and 29, attacked the German Bundestag and later the Democratic Party in the United States. Both allegedly belong to Russian intelligence. Nothing was done to stop them. North Korea, the West doesn't have a clear idea what is happening in North Korea, and this real empire of evil is surprising the West again and again in their moves. And last, an ongoing investigation <coughs> in the United States of the <coughs> alleged inappropriate, inappropriate uh, connection between uh, Russian intelligence and people around Mr. Trump. And lately, news that Mr. Trump leaked sensitive Israeli intelligence that he was not supposed to share with anyone outside the United States to the Russian foreign minister. And this is just you know, a brief um, list. Secretary Chertoff, looking at the last attacks, attack in Manchester, don't you think that this is a proof, another proof, that the Western intelligence is not supplying the shield, the protection the citizens deserve. <clears throat> well, first let me begin by um, welcoming the panel. I think it's a great topic for discussion. I also want to, um, again, say publicly that my condolences go to the family members who lost loved ones and those who were wounded in the attack in Manchester, which was uh, even more evil than the average terrorist attack because it really targeted children. I mean, it's, it's about as, as uh, nefarious as you can imagine. Um, let me begin by saying this. <clears throat> Intelligence actually doesn't protect people. Intelligence provides information to those who have the responsibility to protect. <clears throat> and many of the, quote, failures you've described are not failures of what I would say are collection or analysis. They're failures of people either to operationalize what they were told or failures to appreciate the value because of uh, people being wedded to their own narrative or their own view of events. So I'll, I'll give you just some examples. You talk about the issue of rise of ISIS. Um, I think a, a, a significant part of the problem there was, and I'm going to be critical of my own country, the administration at the time was wedded to a narrative that they were putting out that bin Laden is dead, terrorism is done, we won, look how great we are. And as a consequence... So as the they, professor said, terrorism is not no, no right. longer relevant. And, and I think, therefore, they were uh, perhaps induced to overlook the signs they were getting from the intelligence community that actually terrorism wasn't done. It had simply morphed to the next iteration. Then there are problems with oper uh, operationalizing intelligence. Uh, someone is, in fact, identified, and then they can't follow through with it. And again, the open reporting on Manchester is that the individual who appears to be the suicide bomber was on the radar screen. In fact, people in the community identified him as someone who's becoming radicalized. They looked at him, and because all they could do was either decide, is he, uh, can he be arrested or not? And once they said he couldn't be arrested, they kind of stopped. And I think, how do you deal with that issue of someone who's not committed a crime yet, but is maybe gestating a crime, I think that's a challenge of operationalizing intelligence. And then finally, you do have cases where something is missed or the analysis is incorrect, but I think it's important not to put it all on the intelligence community. And, and in the case of Manchester, I think the uh, failure to appreciate, you have to have a way to monitor people, even if you can't arrest them. I think that was really where there was maybe a lapse. Thank you. Mr. Schuf, um, two quick questions. <coughs> what is the level of alert in the Netherlands now, following uh, Britain's elevation to their uh, threat uh, uh, level to, to critical? And second, 
think that some of what Secretary Chertoff just referred need to have better legislation, or at least different legislation, and that legislation might lead to some violation of basic human rights. What are you doing in the Netherlands? Well, first of all, uh, uh, the threat level in the Netherlands is uh, what we call substantial. It's, uh, we got a five-point system, and it's on four, which means that uh, uh, there is a real chance of an attack in the Netherlands. But so do you, you have a specific info, specific intel suggesting that there might be an attack? No, if we have specific info, it's five. It's five. Okay. And then it's critical. Um, and after the UK, we then uh, went from four to five. Um, and uh, we discuss it, of course. Every time when something happens, we discuss it. Every time uh, we, we look very critical at the way we define uh, our readiness. Um, but the UK, uh, Manchester, uh, did not affect our system because we could not uh, put a, a link to the Netherlands so far. Uh, and certainly not in relation to our uh, uh, alert uh, level. Um, and, and to go back to the other question... Uh, but but in terms of how many people, if you can give us the number, how many people you have that are marked as dangerous under surveillance, under any kind of scrutiny in the Netherlands? Well, we had, as, as intelligence normally does, we don't give those figures. Uh, but we have... Uh, there are no journalists here. It's just Mr. Between us. Oh, I'm <laughs> absolutely <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's on TV, right? Uh, although it's closed circuit. No, but... Um, uh, we have 280 uh, uh, foreign terrorist fighters uh, into the Syria-Iraq area related to uh, ISIS. Uh, probably um, uh, 180, 190 are still there. And uh, when ISIS is going to be scattered one day or another, um, it will not be defeated. It will be scattered. Um, they will probably uh, return to Europe, return to the Netherlands, or they will stay in that area, or they will go to another fighting area, uh, like Libya, uh, for example. And as per the legislation? <coughs> well, our legislation, yeah, the, the question of the legislation, but let me put one other thing. I mean, we also look at radicals. Um, and there is, uh, the, but you we were going to ask the question to the last uh, uh, panel member, but there is a, a, a relation between extremism and terrorism, although it's, it's not, not every extremist is going to be a terrorist. But it's very important to look at radicals and to extremists. And um, we think in the Netherlands we have about a few hundred uh, direct followers uh, of the foreign terrorist fighters in relation to ISIS, and probably 1,000, 1,500, uh, which we care about, let's put it that way. And they didn't do anything wrong. Um, um, and we are uh, very closely looking, and, and that I, I will, before I go to the legislation, I want to uh, uh, say something about Michael Chertoff also mentioned. I mean, we are looking into people who didn't do anything. So from the law enforcement, from the police, or from the prosecutor, we cannot act. So therefore, we have intelligence. But we also have something different, and that's uh, case management. At the local level, we uh, identify people who we worry about. And then we, we talk, um, and the police and prosecutor is involved, but the local community, local government is the most important player, together with education, social welfare, parents, neighborhood policing, in seeing how can we intervene before they really radicalize. Mm -hmm. And if they really radicalize and if they become a danger, if, if they think that they are going to travel uh, uh, to uh, Syria, Iraq, or some other place as a foreign terrorist fighter, we will probably intervene with the police or someone. So that's very important. And as of now, actually today, in, in those newspapers, there is a, 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 a big debate whether we are not violating privacy in, in discussing these people who didn't do anything but just took attention of government because they maybe could be radicalizing. Um, and we think we are on the right path because if we, if we don't intervene, uh, they will probably radicalize even further. So there maybe we should adapt when a little bit. When you say intervene, sorry for interrupting. So when you say intervene, it means calling them for some sort of a conversation? Yeah, a conversation or talk with our teachers or talk with a sports club or... A, Okay. So that we, that we somehow, before punishing them, maybe a little bit of help would prevent them from uh, becoming radicalized. Thank you. Um, so it's a carrot and stick approach. Mr. Frank, we have witnessed a series of attacks against private and government institutions, cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is also under attack? Well, Microsoft, we have a fairly ubiquitous footprint, and so our customers are, uh, there's a number of customers that we have. 
and uh, and the number is an understatement. Yes, the our, our products are widely used, and and so the most recent WannaCry attack did impact many of our customers. Just uh, to tell the audience, WannaCry is the virus that attacked many medical institutions in Britain and worldwide last uh, two weeks ago. Right, and WannaCry was uh, you know has the story of apparently the. U.S. NSA had discovered a vulnerability. Uh, we don't know when, and then also we don't know when they lost control of it, uh, but we do know it appeared um, with a uh, with a sort of black hats group on the web, um, and we then believe that it was um, some nation state that weaponized uh, the code and released it. Um, just about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a few different issues there, but one of them is we've long encouraged governments when they discover vulnerabilities in software that we're collectively all better off if they're disclosed responsibly to the vendor so that they can be patched. And in fact, you know, so we did learn about this and, and issued a patch in March. Uh, and and so machines that were patched, Windows 7's machines, were not vulnerable to the attack. Windows 7 machines that were not patched um, were vulnerable to it. Windows 8, Windows 10 machines, uh, the kernel had been hardened so they weren't uh, susceptible to the attack. But, but there's the issue of responsible disclosure. Um, and, and then there's the other issue of what's reportedly a state actor attacking civilian infrastructure. Um, and and there's, there's good work going on. The Dutch government is sponsoring um, a study along with East West Institute and um, the Institute for International Studies or Strategic yeah. Studies in, in The Hague. Uh, the UN uh, group of government experts is, is also trying to come out with a report in the next few weeks with some norms about government conduct uh, and those are very important steps to take um, because I think we, we can all agree that there's really no point, I mean, governments should not be attacking civilians and civilian infrastructures or banking infrastructures, especially in times of peace. Um, but as we've, we spent some time working on this but, process. But, sorry, sorry for, but they are being attacked and the question still remains, do you think that private companies, private individuals should get state defense, as they have, you know, policemen patrolling the street and defending from, from criminals, or big companies like Microsoft or like whatever, AT&T, need to have their own intelligence service to defend themselves because the CIA does and the FBI doesn't do that. Well, we do, in fact, have, have an extensive group of analysts who follow all the advanced persistent threats. Uh, and, you know, so in this case, you know, we do, we, we're going out with a, a call for industry to collaborate more so that we can share information um, and, and agree to responsible practices. I mean, first of all, um, it's important that technology companies be trusted by pledging that they're going to be 100% committed to defense and 0% offense. And so at Microsoft, you know, that's an easy position for us to take. Um, similarly, we're not going to put back doors in commercial products, right? That's, again, an easy position for us to take, but we need, we need industry to do that. Yeah. Well, but you, then you make note, but maybe intelligence service will in order to defend them. Well, we're not gonna cooperate with it, right? And if, if intelligence services wanna, you know, what, if they wanna, I mean, governments are going to conduct their intelligence work, but they should not be attacking civilians in time of peace, especially in these broad attacks. And, and we've, we're trying to work more cooperatively as an industry on attribution, because one of the biggest challenges is every there's sort of pointer, finger pointing, but everybody denies that they did anything. And, and yet we have a great deal of scientific information from the telemetry from all those Windows devices that are hooked up to the internet. And, and so we can share that with, ideally, a, an independent agency, can be industry-sponsored, that can gather the scientific data from a variety of parties and, and publish scientific analysis that, that will let people 
reach conclusions about who's behind it. And, and that can help create more accountability in the system so that governments can respond with more confidence. Um, and, and perhaps, we hope, over time, governments will not take some of these actions. Mr. Salmi, um, in order to have good intelligence, you need to have good people. In order to have good people, you, have, you need to have good training. What, according to your assessment, is the, I would say, the level of quality training for intelligence operative in Europe? Thank you. First of all, I want to underline one clear thing where the, if you look into the Lisbon Treaty, which states that the national security belongs to the competence of the member states. So this also reflects in a way that the services, the member states themselves, have the responsibility to organize the training the way they see fit. And then again, having looked at this from the European perspective and a level, we do have a difference between the United States, for example, where in the US there is, let's say, a well-founded and, and long-lasting tradition in intelligence, in the intelligence culture training, and also how to, let's say, um, inform and um, uh, teach the intelligence users as well, or you know, educate them how to use intelligence in the wisest way. I do feel that also on the European level, that's probably a thing which is done in one way in all the member states. I mean, there's certainly not a one, one size which, which fits all. I would imagine they all have their own, own systems. On the European level, and especially in, in this era when we have the Schengen Agreement in place, we have the free movement of people, we have common challenges in Europe, we have to look into what we can do on an EU level in cooperation with the member states. And th this is exactly what we tried to do over the past years, is to actually come up with uh, a certain intelligence culture on, on in the EU and among the EU institutions with the help of the services. And, uh, and as I said, I would love to see, uh, at, at least in Brussels, that we have an, a certain way of doing things and the member states would be very well aware how these things are done, wh what do we expect, how we could uh, then again contribute back to the member states. But indeed, it varies tremendously and there's a long way to go. This was a, this was a long and diplomatic uh, answer to my question on mm. the level of their training. Yeah. Mr. Salmi, are they well trained? I would say that most of the services that I have been working with, actually all of them are very well trained. Of course, the capabilities do change tremendously. I mean, if you take one of the bigger member states, bigger services, they certainly have much more resources than, like the service that I know best, where I served for two decades, which is a small service and relies and on... What others. is the sphere that needs, a, I would say, the, the, the better empowerment? The sphere of intelligence, seeking vision, human, collection of intelligence, technology? That's probably, again, an, an issue that you, know, you can't really give an one definitive answer. I mean, it, again, varies from, from one service to another. I think one thing which might or could be very helpful would be that how, do the, uh, how is the analytical product produced? What sort of a methodology do you use? This is actually a quite safe uh, field for those services to cooperate, and that's already done to a certain extent. And then again, in a smaller groups within the EU member states, for example, and, and, and uh, let's say like among the Nordic countries or what have you, you have similar societies, similar legislate, uh, legislation and, and the legal framework which allows you to cooperate probably in much more in-depth than you, you, you could with, with some other member states, for example. Secretary Chertoff, you came to be the Secretary of Homeland Security in difficult times. And one of the main tasks was to have a much better coordination between the different, I think, 14 different intelligence, um, intelligence agencies. What was the main thing, that, the main lesson that you can inherit to your European counterparts on coordination? <coughs> well, um, <coughs> I would say that, um, of course, it was, a, in terms of <coughs> coordinating within the department, as the secretary, I had the authority to simply order people to do things, so that makes it somewhat easier. The harder thing is among different departments. Um, and certainly harder still is across national boundaries. Um, but I think there are a number of things you can do. First of all, you need to make sure you have a common understanding, not just of the threat, but of what it is you're trying to achieve and the tools you have to achieve it. That means, for example, a common language, standard approaches to things, standard ways of evaluating things, and things of that sort. Um, second, I think you need to do what in the military is called, um, make sure people understand commander's intent, understand what the mission is, what it is you have to accomplish. You don't want to micromanage all your components, but you do want to give them uh, 
clarity about what they're trying to achieve and also have cross-fertilization. To take an example, not in the area of terrorism, but um, in the area of mass migration. When I came in, uh, we had a system where we had so many people crossing the border that we were apprehending that we didn't have enough space to detain them. So most of them were released and they never showed up for hearings. So we had two choices. One is we can really spend a lot of money and build a lot more beds, or we can figure out how do you change the system so that you can move people who are apprehended who don't belong in the country back to where they came from more quickly. <clears throat> so that was the objective. And we brought in the various component elements, those who apprehended the border, those who managed detention, those who arranged for repatriation. And we looked at the system end to end. <clears throat> we re recognized that if we accelerated the repatriation process to make it contemporaneous with the apprehension process, we could cut by two thirds the amount of time it took to send somebody back, which was like tripling the beds. And within less than a year, we had eliminated the need to release people because of lack of bed space. So that's an example of how you coordinate and, and operationalize an objective. Are you satisfied with the level of coordination between the inside the US intelligence community today? Do you think that there's a much lesser risk that, God forbid, another September 11 occur? I, I think it's far better than it was um, because we built a culture of sharing, although I will tell you, uh, after 9-11, there was a real effort to get people to push their intelligence out. Then we had the Snowden episode. That now caused, they need to keep in. Yeah, they, and that caused people to say, wait a second, let's keep it to ourselves. And I still think we're trying to find the happy medium. The good news is there are some technical things that can be done to data that allow people to see it, but not necessarily to download it or manipulate it. And those tools allow you to put much more finely grained rules in place when you share data. Yeah. And if we had um, General Michael Hayden, who works with you, standing here, um, he would say, and I quote from an interview that he gave me, that, that Snowden affair was the one single most severe hemorrhaging in the history of American intelligence. So, uh, I, I think that's probably right. Um, and you know, and some, some of what he put out, of course, was exaggerated. But uh, it went well beyond what he was complaining about, which was a particular program to collect metadata um, on, on wide scale. He put things out there that touched on all kinds of issues that have no civil liberties component, but really seemed designed largely to damage the US and its relations with allies, to damage US companies, to create a lack of trust. And I, I, it will not have escaped your notice that while he's been very critical of the US, he's safely ensconced in Russia, not necessarily known as the paragon of civil liberties around the globe. So you can draw your own conclusion from that. Yeah. And I can support it. I was part of the, uh, the Spiegel team that analyzed much of the documents that uh, uh, Snowden uh, stole and, and later uh, gave to some journalists, and mainly and probably to, to Russian intelligence. And much of that did not relate to violation of civil rights. And there was a, even a discussion inside the group of journalists and, and, and um, commentators what to release bet among the 1.2 million point two documents that, that he leaked. Uh, my case, uh, my claim was that if you leak documents that relate to an NSA, CIA hunt for the real bad guys, proliferated Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, then you did basically jeopardize the legitimacy of the whole project. Uh, I can understand a German journalist who is uh, uh, somewhat furious to see that the NSA is uh, hacking into the phone of the chancellor, but uh, to leak information about how the NSA is following proliferators of nuclear weapon, this is something else. Um, but in, in coordination inside the, the American intelligence agency is one thing, and, and uh, Ilka Salmi, to have coordination inside Europe is another thing. And I have a German um, hiring uh, official said, we wanted to have a European CIA, but we failed. We realized that this is not doable. We are not being able to share the information and to bridge all the logistical, linguistic, and other um, things. So, so what's next? How do you create a CIA in Europe, yeah. if you want to create one? Indeed. That's, well, that's very much a political issue, of course, above my pay grade to decide whether there's a political will to do that or not. 
But there are a few, as I mentioned, there are a few limitations or, or legal issues that we have to tackle first. As I said, the Lisbon Treaty quite clearly states that the national security falls under the competence of the member states. This again means that the member states will organize their security, whether it's countering terrorism or uh, intelligence activities, what have you, the way they wish to do that. At the same time, I truly believe that there is a room for, let's say, multi multilateral sharing of, of intelligence within the EU and probably even a bit wider. And there is already a an, an, an small nucleus uh, in that sort, which is the EU's INTSEN, which is the EU Intelligence and, and Situation Center, which is a small team of, of roughly a couple of hundred of people in Brussels today, which basically sh shares and assesses uh, strategic intelligence shared by the member states. They don't have any collection capability of their own, but they do get contributions from the member states, which then in turn uh, combined with open source intelligence and, and any publicly available information, what have you, is produced into assessments which are then shared with the political decision makers on, on Brussels level. So we do have a an, an, an small, let's say a small team already which is, exists, but I want to underline it does not have any operational no tactical role in that sense. And this, again, it's not only about Lisbon, Lisbon Treaty, it's also the national uh, legislations in place. I mean, the devil's in the detail in this. If you start looking into who shall control the uh, use of coercive measures in one of the member states, whether it should be done somewhere on an EU level or on a national level, today the answer is very clear. It's the national level which decides on that. Um, I, as I said, I, I served as the head of, of, of INSEN for five years, and I, what, what I could see over those years was that actually the willingness to share uh, increased tremendously. I mean, both quantity-wise and quality-wise from the contribution from the men, member states, as there was also an understanding that this is an added value for, for some, of the, some of the member states at least. Let me go back to the fact, coming from Finland and one of the smaller member states, I can imagine that the Finnish politicians as well as the security authorities did benefit from the contributions and assessments that were done by, by EU INTS and on the EU level. So it was a two-way street. But this is a starting point. I do not personally see that in a short or medium, probably not even in the long term, there would be an, a trend to go towards an Europe, you know, European CIA, which would be an EU institution, let's put it that way. The Dutch presidency took an excellent initiative some, some years ago to, to establish some cooperation in countering terrorism, which is more of an, on an operational level. And yeah. Of course, my colleague... So, we go, so we go to, yeah. to the... Uh, Shof, don't you think that, that you, not you personally, but European intelligence services are, are now losing the war when, it, when we are talking about attacks inside Europe? Maybe in contradiction to the fact that, that Daesh, that ISIS is losing its uh, ground in, in Raqqa at Mosul? Yeah, I, th I think the uh, intelligence service in Europe, um, specifically after the Brussels attack, um, did a huge effort uh, during, uh, with the counterterrorism group, um, which is uh, the, all the European uh, intelligence services are working together with Norwegian and uh, Switzerland. Uh, they got a platform and a database in The Hague, actually. Um, mm -hmm. It was established already after 9-11, but it was reanimated, and I think very successfully. And uh, the information is still owned by every, every national intelligence service, but the information is actually shared, uh, because they have the platform, they have the database, they have liaisons of every country in a, in a, in a very secure and safe place, to, to uh, put it that way. And they make big achievements, and every intelligence service, um, I think it's fair to say, after Paris, after Brussels, we saw uh, in the CDG, but also in Europol, um, at the ECTC, the European Counterterrorist Center, uh, an enormous amount of data certainly flowing. I mean, intelligence law first was almost and was that intelligence by in used? In you, can you, maybe you cannot tell us spe uh, the specifics, but do you know of specific attacks that were stopped thanks to that flow of intelligence between different countries? I think the DTG did a good work in that, yes. And I think that some of the arrests that were taking place in European countries were directly related to the work of the TTT group. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, but it's always difficult to say if you lose ground, if you're in the midst of the battle, to put it that way. Uh, but I think the intelligence services and uh, the law enforcement agencies, uh, um, they, they are working more together than ever. And I think a discussion about institutional reform, 
uh, will probably distract us from really operational cooperation. So we, we put a lot of effort, and also Julie Dutch President has already mentioned, on operational cooperation. Uh, not only through the, uh, the counterterrorism group, but also by introducing uh, the so-called roadmap on information sharing, which was about counterterrorism, about border, and about organized crime, because we see all these relations. And it was a very practical roadmap. And the roadmap is still uh, the guiding principle for the EU in trying to achieve operational cooperation. The Slovak presidency took it further, Maltese now, and Esland will probably, uh, well, not probably, I'm sure, they will take it up further. Yeah. Thank you. I will take, uh, we will take a few uh, <coughs> questions from the audience in a minute. Just before that, John Frank, is this from a technical, technological point of view, is this doable? Can you create one data system? one database that would bridge the linguistic difficulties and secrecy, so we won't have, end up with the European snow, then God forbid, then to have all intelligence agencies connected to one single pipeline, share it, enjoy it, and be able to stop the next terrorist attack. Like, when you do a software development project, the first thing you do is you, you sit down and figure out what are you trying to accomplish? What are the requirements? And and Secretary Chertoff, uh, working with Globesec, has just produced a paper which advances the state of the art in thinking about, well, what, how should an information sharing system work so that you can have confidence that information you're sharing is going to be used but not abused and you can retain control over it, uh, it won't be passed on. And, and I, I commend that paper as, as the basis for um, you know, further work to make practical the implementations of that. But, but generally, you know, technology can do most everything, and, and especially we're seeing some, some very good advances, you know, like machine translation. Um, it's not gonna be perfect, but the application of artificial intelligence to machine translation has significantly increased the accuracy to the point that it's, it's quite usable. Um, and, and if we start with, again, more defining a technological standard, uh, you know, as, and learning from the work done in the United States or in Canada uh, on different applications, you can come up with reasonably good systems that let you tag information, that, that create a hash, and, and so if you're on the internet, you know, if you're on the network, you can say, I want to do a check on John Frank, and it'll be a hash, and the other side will get a hash, and, and if it's a positive, it'll get a flag, and, and, and then you can make a request, and you know there's something there. But it's, you maintain confidentiality in the meantime. Um, and there's, there's lots of you know, good, thoughtful advances applying commercial off-the-shelf off technology that, that are, you know, need to be put together, but but I'm confident that the system that's outlined uh, in the paper the Secretary Chertoff's group put together, um, you know, it, it, it's not science fiction. It's something that can be done. And the paper towards uh, called towards uh, Transatlantic Counterterrorism Center of Excellence says, uh, among many other uh, important things, many of the failing failings uh, identified occurred due to problems with standardization legislation and organizational trust. Um, and your final recommendation was to create a transatlantic counterterrorism center of excellence to accelerate tactical and operational standardization. Um, hopefully, this this will happen. Questions from the audience, please. Please. <coughs> My name is Julian Fota. I'm from Romania. Look, I, I disagree with our moderator uh, blaming intelligence services for uh, Crimea for Ukraine. I mean, first of all, we have to put uh, in our discussion the issue of uh, the decision maker. Because in a democratic society, the intelligence services, you know, uh, always act based on political guidance. And in my opinion, you know, we have a problem with some of the, some of the guidance coming from uh, our decision makers. Crimea is mainly, uh, first of all, a failure in strategic thinking, you know, because Russia for a very long time it was considered to be a weak and irrelevant country. 
you know, and then we discover that they are able to do a lot of uh, uh, bad things. So my question for the panel is how can we speak about improving the, the results of our intelligence services without bringing the discussion, the role, the very, very important role played by the politicians, because uh, including when it comes to the fight against terrorism. I think that the issues have to be addressed from a much more uh, broader perspective. Thank you. So we are talking about the interface, very sensitive interface between the chiefs of the intelligence and the chief of the uh, political level. Secretary Chertoff. I think uh, there are two issues. <clears throat> First of all, I'm, I'm in agreement. Um, a lot of blame is laid at the uh, door of the intelligence community, it's really the decision makers. Uh, at one level, I think we need to educate decision makers about how, how to understand what intelligence is. It is not a crystal ball. It cannot guarantee you that what you're going to know what the future is. And understanding the rules of the road in terms of, of um, appreciating the value and the limitations of intelligence, also understanding how to handle it properly. These are, I think, things we can educate people about. But I think the issue you're, you're raising is at a higher level issue. In the end, it's about facing facts that are unpleasant or difficult facts. And as I said earlier in the case of ISIS, but I think it's also true with respect to Russia, um, for all kinds of reasons, I think many decision makers uh, wanted to convince themselves that Russia was to quote former President Obama, a regional power. That statement not only irritated the living daylights out of the Russians and probably provoked a lot of bad behavior, but it also, again, creates a mindset where you tend to look at the intelligence through the prism of what you would like to believe is true. And as my late father used to say, the one thing you can't do is kid yourself. So I think part of what politicians need to understand is they need to be able to, to step out of their own preconceptions and wishful thinking and understand intelligence in a more objective and dispassionate way. Um, any other remarks? Uh yeah, uh, it's, it's a very interesting question, but I think, uh, don't kid yourself, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a good one. Um, I think a professionalism of the intelligence services uh, uh, is key to that. Um, I, I, as, as a coordinator in the Netherlands, I'm, I'm right between the politicians and the intelligence services and law enforcement. Um, and uh, somehow we made an so arrangement. So do you like to work more with the politicians or with your subordinates <laughs> in the intelligence service? <laughs> mm -hmm. I've probably with both because I'm just, I'm the middleman, you might say. But what is important <clears throat> in relation to terrorism is that uh, we made an arrangement that, for example, the level uh, of alert in the Netherlands is not a political decision, but it's a decision of the coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's important. Um, the assessment we make on counterterrorism and on terrorism, uh, but we have a public and a secret. Uh, it, it is sent out every four months together with all the intelligence services, and it is a professional piece of paper. So it's, it's not under political influence. Uh, we publish it, um, and not the politician. So that's, that's, and I think that more or less helps, at least in the Netherlands, to uh, create the right discussions between the decision making on a political level and the professionalism of the intelligence services. But the tools that are adopted by, and I refer to what Secretary Chertoff said before, that it's not just the, uh, the, the, the gathering of the intelligence, but what you do with the intelligence. The tools that are chosen how to fight against terrorism are usually authorized or selected by the political level. The country I come from in Israel decided that it can use um, methods of targeted killing, assassinations, and tortures. This is, this is a big decision that was taken by the, the politicians and many other violations of civil, of civil rights in order to defeat terrorism. And I think the Israeli intelligence community has been very successful in much of its effort. So, Mr. Salmi, do you think that your country or Europe maybe should imply other tools? For example, should Europe be part of targeted assassination or targeted killing operations of the United States and Britain in Syria and Iraq against Daesh? As you rightly pointed out, it's a political decision, which I very much doubt, because I think it will go very much against the, the, some of the values that, you know, the, at least the EU stands for. And on the behalf of Finland, uh, you know, even if I, I do not represent that country or the, any agencies anymore, I would see that very unlikely to, to happen. But just if I may, just very quick remark concerning the, indeed, the issue with, let's say, the early warning and the early action. It's sometimes, it's not always an intelligence failure. It's always a question that, okay, what then, when the sometimes uncomfortable truth has been put on the table? Who, who acts and how and when and, and with what sort of a means? 
that's, that's clearly an issue. And then more on, let's say, uh, on a tactical mm -hmm. level, I would say that what we did in Intern was that we actually started back in 2012 uh, a training, what we call the tr uh, uh, intelligence for intelligence users, which basically was in, in order to make the EU level decision makers to understand what the intelligence can do, at least what, what the Intern could do for them and what sort of an means we had and Do you available. think that today they are less skeptical about the impact of intelligence, the assistance the intelligence can give them? It certainly had a very well, positive impact, yes. better educated politicians? Uh, in that sense, at least as far as intelligence is concerned. Secretary Chertoff, any remark from you on the use of targeted killing? Well, it's better than untargeted killing. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, the reality is if you're in war, you do uh, have to kill the enemy. And if you can be precise and uh, not have innocent people caught up in it, I think that's a good thing. Mr. Shub, if you capture a terrorist, you know that he is a ticking bomb. He knows where's, where's the next bombing going to take place. Something maybe is happening in the UK right now. Would you justify the use of special measures during the interrogation? Well, not if it's not in according with our law. You know, clear as that. People would say you should change the law because the situation changed. Yeah, but as long as the law is not changed, we will not do. No. You know, there was an incident <coughs> I remember when this debate was raging many years ago, there was an incident, I believe it was in Germany, where a police chief apprehended the kidnapper of a girl. The girl had been buried alive. She was not going to be able to survive buried alive without food and water and adequate air. And at some point in interrogating the kidnapper, I think the uh, police chief pulled out a gun and said, I'm going to kill you if you don't tell me where she is, which is technically the definition of torture. And he did tell the police chief, and she got, he got there too late. They couldn't save her. But if you think about that scenario, um, you know, part of the, the debate about interrogation often gets into the question about whether it's effective or not. But that's a case where it was effective. And um, maybe if the police chief had pulled the gun out a little earlier, the girl would have been saved. So putting aside what the, whether you want to embody in the law, there's always a question I think people are going to face a moral question about, in that circumstance, um, how do you make the decision? What do you do? Yeah. More questions? Please. Yes, hi. My name is Brooks Tigner. I'm EU NATO analyst for Jane's Defense in Brussels. Um, we hear a lot about how the EU and NATO need to step up their uh, exchange of intel. <laughs> and and NATO is not obsolete. Yeah, yes. And also that this must include, of course, cyber, um, cyber intel attack. But um, the amount of, of intel that's actually exchanged between the two is very limited. Um, it's limited to masked information, metrics about malware, etc. It doesn't go much beyond that because, and I've had my NATO uh, experts tell me this point blank and quite recently for two reasons. One, um, there aren't that many people at the EU who are clear to NATO standards to receive it. And secondly, the EU's security clearance procedures for vetting personnel lower down in the bureaucracy certainly don't meet NATO standards. So my question to you, Mr. Salmon, how do you react to that? And secondly, what is the EU doing about that and how soon? Thank you. Indeed, if, if, if I may, just very quickly. First of all, the, the, the Partially, I do, I do agree. First of all, the, the one thing we, what we have with the EU officials is that very few, I, I think the ratio is somewhere like one-fifth of the, of the officials are, are security vetted. They have a clearance. That's the starting point. The second issue is indeed that well, how, how do we carry out those screenings is actually with the help of the member states. We always go back to the, uh, the member state in question. If it's a Finnish citizen, we'll go back to the Finnish authorities, etc. Um, what we have just started with the Belgians last year actually is, is an, a, a screening procedure where there's a memorandum of understanding with the Belgians so that we can, we can now really screen more of our staff with them also in, in it, it's not a security clearance as such, but it's, it's something a little lower than that. I hope that this will help out the issue and indeed there is constant discussion between the NATO and EU what can and what could be shared and by whom. Then again, I would say that there is a sufficient number of people with a relevant uh, level of, of, of clearance on the EU side as well. So it's, it, I don't see that that should be the biggest bottleneck in, in, in that cooperation. 
there's no just it's not just a uh, terrorist risk. Um, Ed Lucas just of the Economist just joined us, and he was the, one of the first to warn of the the Russian threat. Um, to the extent that even Snowden was maybe uh, operated by Russian uh, intelligence. Jones Frank, do you think, do you see a state level cyber attacks that maybe you're able to connect to Russian or Chinese or even Iranian intelligence? There's no doubt that there are state sponsored cyber activities that should not be taking place. Um, and, you know, that we do believe that there ought to be a basis for better attribution. And, and as a company, some of these governments are our customers. Um, and, you know, we have telemetry data, we've got forensic malware analysis, um, and we've got a set of information that's different from often what governments have from their signals intelligence or human intelligence. Um, and, you know, we think it's important to create some way that there can be objectively people can feel more confident about making an attribution. And so whether industry, we'll start as industry putting, standing up an organization, and if governments choose to share that information with, with the computer scientist at that organization, that's fine. But you know, I think the realities are that, you know, we've seen that the Obama administration analysis of, of why they believe the Russians were the ones hacking the DNC, it was fairly thin uh, in terms of what they actually put, put out. And, and, you know, I think... So you're not sure that it was Russian military I'm not intelligence? saying that at all. I'm just saying that governments have reasons not to disclose a great deal of information that may reveal their sources and methods. Uh, and, and so, you know, but we... We can, if we collectively, with us and other major technology companies that observe carefully what's happening, um, can share information, um, and we can have that published. Uh, governments can add their own. Yeah, but in return, the governments would ask you or a private company that was just attacked yeah. to let their virtual spies or cops go into their systems and check what happened to to, to do the forensic. And maybe well, even have a legislation that would uh, permit the intelligence agency to do the forensic uh, post attack without notifying the company, well, which is something well, that you object. Right, of course. But, but well, but they, but governments can can act. A lot of this information is on the open internet, so you can. I mean, in a sense, one can one can access much of this information. But we we've got a very extensive information sharing program where we share threat intelligence um, with with national governments with their certs, through banks, and through ISPs. Um, and you know, trying to um, ensure that, you know, for example, botnet information is shared because that is a source of uh, indirectly of many of the attacks. Um, so we do publish a great deal of information. We work closely, and I've got to say, industry. This is not something where, you know, we view it as primarily a, a competitive issue. We view it as a. You know, it's in the. It's in the interest of our industry together. And so the level of cooperation between us and people you would consider to be competitors uh, is surprisingly high. Mm -hmm. Dick Schoff, are you afraid that, that Russia would attack, cyber attack the Netherlands? Uh, well, uh, afraid is not my language. Um, Concerned. But uh, uh, we... Intrigued. We, <laughs> <laughs> well, better. intrigued is too, too diplomatic. <laughs> no, we're sure that... Uh, actually, we also publish uh, our cyber threats. And... and um, and we are sure that Russia, China, Iran are, uh, 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 have cyber attacks, have cyber espionage on our research and developments, our companies, our government, uh, and probably have, uh, are trying to enter our vital infrastructure. Not to act, but to prepare to act. Um, so we are working very hard uh, with our uh, cyber security center and also with intelligence services and the, the uh, and law enforcement to build up a, a, a resistant <coughs> detection network and also a response network. But we are a small country, so we have to be wise when we respond. Secretary Chertoff, did you ever dream that Russia would meddle inside U.S. elections? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure dream is the right word. I, I, I can't say I, I was... I, can't, I cannot say I was shocked, partly because having <coughs> attended 
uh, GlobeSec sessions over past years. Um, actually, I, you know, this has been a phenomenon in, in Central and Europe and Western Europe. So you're saying time. that in order to know what, ha what would happen in two years, we need to be in GlobeSec today? Well, I mean, it, it was actually a great forewarning. I mean, I, I remember going back to the States and telling people, you know, this is an issue in Europe and it's actually affecting public opinion. And people looked at me like I was having flashbacks to the Cold War. Um, I think the fact that the Russians hacked into uh, political databases, that's gone on for years, I and mean, that's espionage. What was different is the apparent release of that information to mold public opinion. Um, I don't know that it had a, a, an effect on the outcome, but I suspect what it will do is encourage behavior like this in the future, and I think now And maybe now it's happened happen in France. Right, and now I think what you're seeing, what we're taking to the next level would be two additional things. If, as in France, they not only released things, but they released phony things, <coughs> altered documents, altered photographs, that would then take it to the next level. And finally, there's a, a growing concern about the integrity of the voting process itself. If you move to a completely electronic process uh, and someone was able to hack into the database or hack into the network, you could actually have a, a question about the election. A couple of years ago in the Ukraine, apparently, uh, Russians hacked into um, the uh, television, one of the television networks. What they were going to try to do was affect the way the network reported the outcome of the race where there was a pro-Russian candidate running for president. I think they understood at the end of the day when the actual votes were counted, the, the correct outcome would be, would be revealed. But I think what their calculation was is that the discrepancy would cause people to doubt which was true and which was false. And in many ways, when you look at Russian information operations, I don't know that it's necessarily that they think they're going to persuade most people that what they're putting out is true, as much as it is they're going to persuade most people nothing can be trusted. And that's exactly the undermining of institutions, which creates a lot of damage. This is a, a gloomy consequence. Ed, please. Very brief question to you, and then a question to the panel. Um, if this happens in Germany, will the German media run around like headless chickens like the American media did, not realizing that the political system is under attack and just reporting whatever has been stolen from the um, emails of, of, the, of the German politicians? Or will they behave like the French media, which behaved very responsibly and said someone's attacking our political system and we're not going to cooperate? So while you think about that, my question to the panel is you're talking as if technology has stopped, but yet what we have witnessed over the last 15 years, an enormous technological change, which has already turned the world of intelligence upside down once. And I suspect it's going to do so again. So I'd like to ask you just to cast your minds forward to five years' time. We've really got big data, facial recognition algorithms um, really working. So with one photo of one person, you can check instantly, are they who they say they are? That's going to make traditional cross-border human intelligence really difficult. It's the end of the cover identity, which has been the basis of intelligence since the Bible. Um, it's much harder to keep secrets. We've seen not just with Snowden, with shadow brokers, things that were the absolute crown jewels, high side, protected by data diodes, no way you can hack into that de network, and they're coming out of NSA and being released on the internet. It, looks, it seems it's really hard to, collect se to, to keep secrets. On the other hand, much hard, much easier, perhaps, to um, obtain those secrets electronically. So I'd, just, I'd like to ask you to um, reflect on where we, when we're talking about this in five years' time, what are we going to be talking about in, in regards to technological change? Thank you. One word about the, the coverage in the, the German press, which I'm not going to be the judge of, and I don't read German, but uh, there was a wonderful report that was just issued, a uh, cover story by Die Zeit, Holger Stark in Die Zeit, uh, that was published in English as well, which I uh, uh, highly recommend reading about how APT29, uh, Cozy Bear, and Fancy Bear both infiltrated uh, German parliament and German uh, political system and stole gigas of information that yet didn't surface. There's the risk and the concern and the intrigued people that are fearing that this is going to be used against, for example, Chancellor Merkel in the upcoming uh, elections. And I want to sharpen and add to, uh, to that question. Are we witnessing, following biometric systems, are we witnessing the end of human intelligence? Secretary General. Well, first of all, let me say, I, I, I think there were ap we're already seeing a tremendous change in the, in the 
volume of what is collected and the uh, analytical use that can be made out of what is collected. And I think in many ways it's going to be a uh, uh, paradise for intelligence agencies. Now, are you going to lose human intelligence? Um, <clears throat> you know, you may lose a lot of the uh, kind of James Bond type of thing where someone masquerades as somebody else and, uh, you know, goes under deep cover. But a lot of human intelligence... But Aston Martin is producing a, a Jeep that right. would be much more reasonable price. So than the S price, yes. <laughs> um, but I do think what you'll continue to see, what I think has always been the backbone of human intelligence, which is people who are legitimately in a place for whatever reason, whether it's a noble reason or an ignoble reason, coming forward to relay information uh, about what's going on. So I, I don't... I think you'll see changes in the way... Um, human is collected and, and transmitted, but I'm confident you're going to consider, continue to see that as an important dimension of intelligence. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Just a couple comments. I mean, there, I think there's two challenges. A lot of things you mentioned as future are exist today. You know, the facial recognition quality um, is, is very good. And given the, given the, the power of cloud computing, uh, and the extensibility of, of data, um, it's not hard. There's two challenges. One is a lot of the commercial technologies trying to figure out how to make it work in a secure world, figuring out how to balance that and, uh, you know, it can be done, but there's some work there. The second one is, is more on the political judgments and, you know, democratic Parliaments need to make decisions about how they feel on 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 some of these issues, and and certainly, its technology can be applied to make the choice closer through data minimization, essentially. Um, and and so there can be there can be things done to advance that. But, I, but those are the two areas where I see are, are more more the challenge. Than actually artificial intelligence and and and, and that John, technology. John Frank, in, in, in yes or no, do you think that there will be a day when someone will be able to build a system that could cheat on biometrics? Oh, undoubtedly. There's always going to be. I mean, you know, I guess you know one of the biometric indicators we all use are fingerprints, and yet I believe it was reported that the Chinese stole the fingerprints of everybody with a security clearance in the United States. So, you know, how do you, you know, you've got, you know, every system. So maybe there's, there's still a, but, a future but, uh, for, for James Bond. But let me give you an example of how exactly how things compensate for that. So the concern is someone's going to take a fingerprint and make a latex print. I, I am advising a company that actually uses ultrasound to identify fingerprints. So they're three-dimensional, and it can actually even detect blood flow. So a latex print is not going to work because it's not going to have the blood flow. Now, I guess you could cut someone's finger off and before the blood stops flowing, you could use that. But good luck with that as a technique. <laughs> well, do not try this at home. <laughs> Please. Yes. We had a question over there. Please. And now we are going to keep it very short. Short questions, short answers. Sure. Kivai Sadik, Associate Professor. Well, um, you touched upon transatlantic uh, intelligence sharing in counterterrorism. And the panel touched mostly on the issues at uh, EU level. This Eurocentric view, do you think it's a, a hindrance or to what extent it can be a hindrance in terms of considering the transnational nature of threats? Uh, with a special focus, I am asking that for non-EU NATO members, not only United States, but it can be a challenge for members like Turkey, for example. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Thank yeah. you. Mr. Sun, could you address it? Yeah, just to kick off with that, I think you know the Eurocentric view probably also comes from the fact that you know working for the EU, it is at least as far as I'm concerned, was the natural approach. I do feel that when it's it's more than let's say outside the EU, whether it's a trans uh, transatlantic uh, dimension or otherwise, <coughs> I think then again it's still the more bilateral cooperation or what have you, five eyes between some of the partners, then really the EU working with with third countries, because then again, as I mentioned. The EU at the, uh, today and any intelligence or anything which is remotely uh, resembles intelligence is actually based on, on member states 
uh, information and intelligence that they share with us. So always, you know, the originator's consent going back to the, the, the sending uh, agency or, or service normally leads to a situation that then the member states and their agencies will cooperate outside the EU uh, on a bilateral basis or the way they wish. So in that sense, I don't see that there's an, any there's no conflict in that sense, but I, uh, as an EU, EU level, the, the sharing will most likely not take place. Of course, the conflicts could arise from the definition of what is a terrorist and uh, who are the common uh, enemies. Question over there, please. Hi, I'm Jakub Pianda from European Values Think Tank in Prague. We are on the Kremlin Watch program, and I want to ask a very single thing. Uh, do you think that, uh, let's, let's say, ele electoral process should be put within the framework of national uh, critical infrastructure? Why I'm asking that is that many intelligence agencies and national security establishments in Europe are thinking in this direction, not only about protecting the process itself, the voting, but the campaigns. They are discussing it, they are training them. So how far should intelligence agencies go to protect the electoral process in, in the national context. Thank you. Uh, could you address it just, just for one, one remark before that? I know that the, the, there's a new entity in Israel called the National Cyber Bureau, which basically uh, coordinate all the cyber defense uh, activities of the country. And they have run a, a, their own research, and they came to the conclusion that uh, voting and election should not be fully automatic and fully electronic. They should leave with the with the notes or with making <coughs> uh, a V or some on some written list and never go to a fully automatic because it's too risky. Dick Schuf, please. Yeah, well, we just had elections um, and um, we had a special team which was formed by intelligence police and, and my office to, to see uh, with the different parties, with the parliament, if there was any influence of any state actor, specifically Russia. Um, so we already made a step, and, and in the end, the, the, the process was, uh, there was no computer involved in anything, not even in the counting process, uh, because of the fear that it might be uh, influenced uh, uh, even on the counting. Um, but I think that will not work out in the long term. Um, so th there will be uh, intelligence and, and others will be involved as, a, as a, the election process as a, a part of our vital infrastructure because we are a democratic society and if the election process is in doubt in our country or in your country or whatever country, we are in real trouble. Uh, at the same time, um, intelligence uh, and, and the way we try to detect uh, uh, state actors or otherwise influence uh, the, the process, we must make very clear probably by oversight or giving good information that we don't go into the content of the different political parties because then we will incriminate the process by ourselves. So that's, that will be the balance. Yes, the woman in the back, please. Sarah Krebs from Cornell University. Uh, the panel opened with a comment about Intel leaks and I'm curious uh, to hear from the panel about how realistic it is to rein those in and prevent those from happening and whether there's any precedent for this um, and what the medium to longer term impacts on Intel sharing there would be if this continued. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, are you afraid that following, I'm, I'm adding to the question of, of the lady, are you afraid that following the recent uh, reports about leakage of information by the United States, either to the media or by the President to Foreign Minister Lavrov, countries would be hesitant to share the intelligence with the U.S.? Well, I mean, we, we've had leaks in the past. Uh, I mean, I think the bigger danger, frankly, to sharing was when you had massive theft of really highly classified stuff with Snowden, but leaks are, are, you know, always present. They do create a problem with sharing. Um, they, uh, sometimes what's leaked is pretty generic um, and not that important, and we may overclassify some things. Sometimes what's leaked is really merely politically embarrassing. But when you're getting to something sensitive, um, it, it is problematic. And again, you can tolerate a certain amount of that, but. Um, if it gets to be a persistent pattern, it does have a negative impact. Please. So from a technological point of view, one can do things to lock things down a bit more. So they're still accessible to people who, who might find the information useful, but in a more limited way, so they can't download something, for example. Um, and, and also with an audit trail of, of who's 
seen something, and, and certainly you can, as a network administrator, be looking for unusual patterns um, you know, using artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, and so you, there's, there are ways to try to address the risk better through technology. Please. We are going to take two last questions. This gentleman. Milo Jones, visiting professor. Um, why are we so passive? In game theory, tit for tat works well. Why is it democracies under attack and not the fragile societies that have to be authoritarian even to hold together? Why don't we go on the offensive? OK, and one last question, please. Uh, thanks. Patrick Tucker, Defense One. Uh, question for Director Chertoff. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, excuse me. Um, we both know we can go back to Washington, D.C. tomorrow, and we'll see wildly different versions of the greatest national security threat facing the United States, depending on whether we're watching Fox or CNN or MSNBC. Uh, do you think uh, that politicization of intelligence is getting worse? Who do you think is uh, the bigger culprit there? And how can uh, the intelligence community be reformed uh, to uh, affect that while still being transparent and accountable to lawmakers? Thanks. Secretary Chertoff, why don't you address this question and then the question of retaliation? <clears throat> so um, I, I think I don't think the intelligence is getting politicized. I think the reporting about what the intelligence community says is getting politicized, and and that's really a media issue. It's not an intelligence community. I'm not issue. sure the President Trump would agree with you. Well, I still hold to my belief. Um, I think it's um, I think the community is not is not politicized, and they often get blamed for that when people just don't agree with, with what they're hearing. On the issue of retaliation, um, yeah, that's a complicated issue. I would say this to you. Um, if you go to Russia, they will tell you we're interfering with their electoral system because we do things like broadcast the news um, and have, uh, you know, support democracy and talk about human rights. I'm not being facetious. They will say they will believe it. So they think they're retaliating against us. And that's a fundamental difference in worldview, which I think is very hard to reconcile. Now, if you start to ask me, do we, um, if there are particular things that are done in terms of hacking or damaging systems or destroying them, then I think there are a range of measures you can take. For example, there was the theft of 500 million Yahoo accounts. And the US government did indict not only two criminals, but two FSB officers as being behind that hack. You can argue whether an indictment is that you know, significant in this instance. But if you started to go after companies, for example, that were stealing information, or you look to apply sanctions, you, you have a series of tools you can use. But you also have to watch the issue of escalation, because those in glass houses have to be careful about throwing stones. Thank you. Mr. Sami, Ilka Sami, in short, do you think that there is reasonable retaliation or reasonable countermeasures that can be applied for example, against Russia, to make them think that there is a price tag attached to what they are doing? Well, that's probably on the political level what the EU, on, on the sanctions policy and otherwise, is exactly trying to, to, to convince them that there is a price to pay on, on that. Yeah. Um, before closing remarks, just wanted to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you to the next session on the future of global free trade starting here at the Danube space after lunch at uh, 3.30, sharp, they said. The lunch will be served in the hotel restaurant on the ground floor. And I would like to close and have very briefly from each one of you, starting with uh, Ilka Salmi, what do you think is the one single step that intelligence agencies need to take now to make the world a better place? Hmm. If I knew that reply, I would probably be doing something completely different. But certainly, I mean, the basis is trust, of course. And then again, I think, you know, the, the main issue is that between the services you have, you have trust in what you do, you have a common understanding, and that will certainly help things out. Because through trust, you sh share information, you share intelligence, which is needed. It's not only need to know, it's also need to share. Please. I would commend people to take up the the Chertoff report of Globesec on, on how to build information sharing systems that, that meet all the equities uh, and, and try to advance it and see if it can be operationalized. Inshallah. Dick Shuf. Well, <laughs> yeah, well I, I think we must not forget that terrorism is about undermining our society, our open democratic society. Uh, and even their attacks serve a purpose that's undermining our society. So the worst thing 
And so the best thing intelligence and we can do is to stick to our core values of our open democratic society, even though sometimes it's very hard to do so because you want to just take your fist and punch. But nevertheless, um, I think it's important. If we, if we cross that line, we will end up in a society we don't want to live in. But, and, and I'm not saying that we should not <laughs> somehow bow a little bit, <laughs> uh, but we must be very keen on uh, stick to our values. Secretary Joseph. Uh, I, I encourage you all to read <coughs> the couple of reports that the uh, Globsec uh, initiative has put out, including one on having centers of excellence. If I was going to suggest one thing is I think we, we are usually quite good at, at tactical intelligence. We need to be, invest more in strategic intelligence, by which I mean looking at um, more broadly what are the long-term causes of radicalization and extremism and how do we combat them looking geopolitically at how our adversaries or rivals use not just military tools, but a whole range of tools to advantage themselves. Um, someone raised the question earlier about did we see what the Russians were doing coming, and uh, it may be that we've been so focused on you know, preventing attacks and being very tactical that we've lost a little bit of the art of bringing a broad range of subject matter experts in to look holistically at what the threat map is and to think about it strategically. So I think that after speaking about all these manner and things and topics, uh, we are ending with a somewhat positive view and less uh, gloomy assessment of the future. Uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished guest, Chertoff, Michael, uh, <laughs> Secretary Michael Chertoff, Dick Shu, John Frank, Ilka Salmi, for their thoughtful and uh, innovative ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Come back to the next session. <laughs>